Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old pass of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. It's a joy being with you this, uh, during this meeting and this day, and it is a great joy being surrounded by all of the able ministers that I've been uh, have had the privilege of sitting uh, around close enough to try to lend uh, an ear to what was being said that I might learn something. Most of these young ministers that we have uh, with us in our congregation tonight started their ministry out at a point far beyond where I am even at this point, <laughs> which is way back. So, you know, I'm, I'm too old to do much catching up, and I'm not trying, and I'm, thank, I'm, I'm thankful, uh, Brother Tyndall, that preaching the gospel is not competition, uh, because I don't have to be worried uh, <clears throat> of being shot out of the saddle uh, from that standpoint, because I've never been in the saddle to be shot out of. <laughs> but I'm thankful to be in your company and to have the company of, of you here this evening. Trust that we will continue to pray for, oh, how I need your prayers. And I know that uh, you're weary and tired tonight. The Bible says that much study is a weariness of the soul. I begin to wonder sometimes if much preaching is a weariness of the soul. <laughs> it may not be a weariness of the soul. It's a feeding of the soul, I hope. But yet it's a weariness of the body. I know that for sure. And I know that you're tired tonight. And I trust that uh, as we endeavor for a little while to speak uh, some concerning God's Word, that you'll be prayerful, for I need your prayers. And, uh, and unless uh, God intervenes in my heart, in my mind, uh, at this time, I certainly shall be a fa failure. It is a great honor to occupy this place with my beloved brother, uh, Elder Lynn, Lynn Harold Russell. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 5. We'll begin by reading a few verses of Scripture there, Lord willing. <clears throat> The Apostle Paul, the author of the book of Romans, says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. <clears throat> and not only so, but we glory in tribulations. What a mysterious statement that is. We glory in tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulation does something good for you. Tribulation worketh patience. And what does patience do for you? Patience works experience. And what does experience do for you? The experiences of your life, personally, individually? Experience worketh hope. And hope does what? Makes you not disappointed in Christ. Hope maketh not ashamed. In many places, when the word ashamed is used, it means uh, where it says, I'm not ashamed, it means I'm not disappointed. For instance, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In other words, I'm not disappointed in the gospel of Christ. Why, am, why was he not? And why are we not disappointed in the gospel of Christ? 
simply because we're not dis disappointed in Christ, in his person, in his works, in his accomplishments, his achievements. We're not disappointed in him for who he is <clears throat> and what he is to our life. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which you have to work real hard for. <laughs> <laughs> by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. <clears throat> As we ponder a message tonight for a few moments, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you a question. <clears throat> And I'd like for you, as we deliver the message tonight, attempt to, trusting in God's grace as our helper, to ask ourselves, each one of us, personally and individually, am I justified by faith? Or are you justified by faith? How are we going to answer that question? How can we answer that question? Are we justified by faith? How do I know I'm justified by faith? What does it mean to be justified by faith? All of these terms are necessary for understanding and definition in order to answer the question as to whether we are justified by faith or not. Now, I'm not talking about regeneration. When we talk about justification by faith. We're not talking about regeneration. We're talking about something that follows and comes after the act of regeneration. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> I, I suppose that in order to adequately get into the, the subject of justification by faith, I feel at least that I should touch on regeneration just for a moment. And uh, <clears throat> explain generation for a little bit. In the first chapter of the book of Romans, we have the works of the depraved. We have the works of depravity labeled in Romans chapter 1. And much could be said about that. We have the doctrine of depravity taught in the third chapter of the book of Romans that describes why we have the works of deprav depravity in chapter 1, the doctrine of depravity, in that we fell in Adam, and of all like all the elect of God, like sheep, have gone astray. All of the race of Adam has gone astray, but not all of the race of Adam has, like sheep, gone astray. <laughs> okay. Uh, in other words, there's some goats involved. The goats went astray too in Adam. But all the sheep, all the elect of God, have, like sheep, go astray, have gone astray in Adam and separated themselves from God and have become, have died of death in trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 3 gives us an autopsy of the dead, not a diagnos diagnosis of the sick. <laughs> you got it, didn't you? So many uh, people today will look upon the third chapter of, of Romans from about verse 9 through about verse 18 or 19, somewhere in there, that it is nothing more than a sick person being diagnosed by the medical profession. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I have your prayers. <laughs> <clears throat> but when we, uh, did you ever see a dead corpse uh, be taken to a medical doctor for a giving a life? Did you, have you ever known of an occasion whereby a sick person would go to a medical doctor and the medical doctor would say, why are you here? Give me some historical background. I want to know why you're here. And that sick person would say, well, I want an aut autopsy made. <laughs> I want you to perform an autopsy on my body. You don't hear that. 
So see, you have to separate uh, diagnostics uh, of the living from, from an autopsy of the dead. The third chapter of the book of Romans and many other places in God's book does not give us, uh, when it's speaking of those that are alienated from God, separated from God because of sin, does not, is not given an, a diagnos diagnosis of the sick, but rather than an autopsy of the dead. Now, <laughs> In order for the sheep of God to be made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins, they must receive here in time, sometime between the moment of conception and the moment of the breathing out of the last respiratory breath of life, the act of regeneration of which the recipient is totally passive in the reception thereof. <clears throat> Titus 3 and 5. <coughs> Not by works of righteousness. Well, you know, really, we need to get <laughs> those other verses before that, don't, do we not? Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to, be, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but general, gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. The Apostle Paul said he himself was involved in this situation, in this condition, at one time in his life. Doesn't sound like a very good uh, condition, does it? That was when he was Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> but after that, he said in verse 4, the love, the kindness, and love of God, our Savior, toward the goats, no, sir, toward the sheep. Yeah. Toward the sheep, and it's important for us to notice who this is directed to, the elect of God, the sheep of God. Uh, <clears throat> but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward men appeared. How? not by works of righteousness which we have done. The Bible commands the child of God to perform works of righteousness, but not in order to, re to be born of the Spirit of God, but because we have been born of the Spirit of God, we are ordained unto uh, those works of righteousness to be performed to give God the honor and the glory in the midst of trials and troubles and tribulations in this life. What is regeneration? By the works, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by no. These two things which happen in the new birth. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it says, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, partly done in the new birth, but not finished. Washing of regeneration is not all that happens in the new birth. If washing of regeneration is all that happened in the new birth, you would be no better than Adam was in his, in his creation before the fall. Right, right, right. He was made a good man uh, of the earth earthy, but he was not made a spiritual man. He did not, he was not possessed with the holiness of God. But he was made in the image and likeness of God and had communion with God. He could speak with God and commune with God, but he was not prepared uh, for heaven and a mortal glory. He was not a spiritual man. He had not the Spirit of God and the holiness of God dwelling within him from the standpoint of spirituality of God. Even though he had in him, in his nostrils, breathed the breath of life and he became a living soul, a natural soul, a natural being. He was sinless, but when he transgressed God's law, he died a death in separation, in alienation from God. And when he died that death, he plunged himself, his wife, 
and all of his posterity all down through time into a death of alienation and separation from God which would be eternally had it not been and would it not be that a remedy was made before the foundation of the world. That God would send his son, Jesus would be obedient to his father, and would come and would accomplish on Calvary's cross that for which he was sent to accomplish to obtain eternal redemption signified and manifested by his resurrection from the grave and his ascension into the heavens whereby he entered into the heavens with that blood that he redeemed whereby he redeemed his sheep on the cross. That blood is applied in regeneration by the Holy Spirit of God and that the application of that blood to the inner man of the sheep or the elect of God is a pro, provides, promotes, uh, uh, causes to occur a washing free from sin in the inner man. And that inner man is cleansed from sin, but at that point, the washing of, by the washing of regeneration, that inner man is not holy and is not fit to live in heaven until the second part of regeneration or the new birth takes place, and that's the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The word renewing is not a renovation of the soul. But it is a change of the very nature of that soul. Amen. And when uh, uh, the inner man is cleansed by the washing of regeneration, by the application of the blood of Jesus Christ, it becomes sinless. But there needs to be a sanctification of the imparting of the holiness of God in the inner man whereby when wherein God may dwell. God is a holy God. God, where God dwells, he must dwell in holiness. God can't dwell in sin. God cannot dwell in sin. And that's been expressed here before. <laughs> that's why God commands and demands that his people, his children, keep house for the Lord and make it a clean place. <laughs> I love this about the, the father of the prodigal son. When his son went wayward and went out and spent all that he had, uh, his father didn't leave his household over which he was head. He didn't go out there and participate in uh, the activities of the situation in which his son was in to try to convert his son and so forth. He left it in the hands of God, knowing it was God's work and his work alone that he could bring that son home. It's not a picture of regeneration. That's a picture of conversion, repentance and conversion in the prodigal son. My point is, the father stayed home and kept house for the Lord, kept house for the son, his son, to keep it a clean, respectable uh, place, uh, <coughs> significantly, uh, supposedly, uh, potentially sinless, that it would be a good place for his son to come home and find a home of love and peace and without sin and problem and trouble, troubles and tribulations. Or even in the midst of those, he would have that peace within him <coughs> Peace is, from, from the standpoint of living in this life, uh, it's not perfect peace as far as our perception of it goes. Peace as we live in this life is not uh, the absence of troubles and problems of life. Sometimes I think uh, and have thought, the only way for me to ever have peace in this life is uh, to be rid of all my problems and all of my troubles. Peace is not the absence of problems and troubles and tribulations in life here. Peace is the activity and response of yourself, your inner man, and bringing your outer man under subjection 
your response and your attitude in the midst of problems and troubles. And that depends upon whether you have been justified by faith in the court of your own conscience, whether or not you have that peace. <laughs> peace in heaven uh, is a perfect peace without problems and troubles. But here on earth, it's in the midst of them. But the renewing of the Holy Ghost is not a renovation of the soul, but is a, is a, a change, a total change of nature. God makes that place clean, cleans out the inner man. He cannot enter in and dwell in the inner man until he cleans it up and makes it a clean, spotless, sinless place for him to dwell within. He does that, and then he, by uh, divine sanctification, sanctifies the soul that he has cleansed, washed in the blood of the Lamb, he sanctifies it with his holiness. He imparts holiness into the inner man, and therein he dwells in the holiness of the inner man. That's why we have such scriptures <coughs> as we find in, where is it, 1 John 3 and 9? Uh, the, the, uh, we cannot, the inner man cannot sin. I know there are some other explanations uh, and approaches to this, but right now, in light of my uh, subject and where I am at this point, <laughs> I would, uh, it says, whosoever, that's what I want, I couldn't get started. First John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God, that's not the outer man, the whosoever is the inner man. Whosoever is born of God, of uh, God doth not commit sin. Some people misinterpret this scripture and says, well, I know I am not justified by faith and cannot be because I still feel to be a sinner. And the Bible says, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. They'll look upon justification by faith the same as though it were the regeneration. But it's not. You cannot be justified by faith until you have been born of the Spirit of God, regenerated. And Christ, God himself, must, be, must dwell in the inner man. He, whosoever is born of God, doth not commit sin, for his seed, masculine, singular, his seed, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. There's a multitude of other scriptures in connection with that. I just wanted to give uh, a brief explanation and establishment of regeneration and show that that must come before the justification by faith in the court of our own conscience. <laughs> the best way, really, that I have found to speak on the subject of justification by faith is um, in that it's hard for me to illustrate. I hear other ministers preach, they explain it so beautifully, but it's hard for me to get the lesson across without illustrating it. I desire to spend some time this evening, the Lord willing, illustrating what justification by faith is. Now, I have touched on regeneration. The fourth chapter of the book of Romans is not a chapter concerning regeneration. In spite of what many people may believe about it, even old Baptists. The fourth chapter of the book of Romans is a subject showing and illustrating through the, uh, <clears throat> the biblical uh, uh, patriarch of old, Abraham, and the activities in his life that he was justified by faith. The fourth chapter illustrates. I'm, I'm going to use another illustration, the Lord willing. But the fourth chapter is leading up to the fifth chapter, and there is an illustration using, the, uh, using Abraham uh, to illustrate that he had been justified by faith. Now, it's amazing that those could be justified by faith on the other side of the cross, just as they can and are on this side of the cross. I've even heard it taught that no one was ever regenerated on the other side of the cross. Uh, it's just on this side, and they couldn't be. I want you to know that God is an unlimited, um, sovereign God, 
and can, can apply something before the legality, positionally and legally, has been accomplished. Uh, Zechariah 14 and 8, in one sense, has the embedment of this. <laughs> it shall be in that day that living waters <laughs> shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the hydra sea, and half of them toward the former sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. Those, uh, the living waters of those uh, rivers, uh, could and possibly does, I believe it does, include uh, the flowing of the application of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to his elect people that lived and died before the cross of before Christ died on the cross, just as well as those on this side of the cross. Many other scriptures and possibly some more appropriate scriptures could be used to prove that. But <laughs> in the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, we have several terms that are important for us to understand. We have in verse 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted, it was counted unto him for righteousness. We have the word counted. We have the word reckoned. Verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In verse 5, we have the word counted again. Uh, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, not regeneration. Uh, in verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness. We have the word reckoned, we have the word counted, and we have the word imputed. You could go through that entire fourth chapter and count the number of times that those three terms are used. And in other places of the New Testament and places in the Old Testament where the words accounted, imputed, reckoned are used. They're very important terms. The old accounting terms. <laughs> and I like old accounting terms. <laughs> I've been to the old school in accounting and it's hard for me to keep up with some of the new terms. <laughs> but these are terms that applies to something already in existence. You can't count something that's not already in existence. Amen. Accounting, accounted, uh, imputed, reckoneth, all have the connotation or the meaning uh, with embedded there, therein as taking inventory. Yeah. Taking inventory. And uh, what God has done in justifying his children by faith, the ones that he does justify by faith. And I believe that the gospel is a means playing a part utilized by God in accomplishing justification by faith, Amen. not regeneration, Amen. but justification by faith. So we have the necessity of the application and the utility of the gospel necessary for one to be, or who's already born of the Spirit of God, to be justified by faith. Regeneration occurs in the court of God. Amen. Justification by faith occurs in another, a different courtroom. It's the courtroom of your own conscience. Yes, sir. In the courtroom of your own conscience. <laughs> it's before yourself. After re in regeneration, there's a whole lot done that you don't realize until you hear the preaching of the gospel. You're justified by faith in the court of your own conscience. And it teaches you that those that have been justified by faith in the court of their own conscience must be justified by works if they're going to honor and praise and glorify the Almighty God. It's justification by faith in the court of your own conscience that promotes justification by your works. Amen. And that glorifies God. <laughs> Regeneration is the factor behind it, the force, the power, the love of God, the grace of God, the spirit of God behind it all. After regeneration, in God's own good time and in his own good pleasure, he takes, and this is a mystery even unto us, but he takes inventory of your heart, not that he might find out what is there, 
but that he might, in taking inventory of your heart, he might show you what he has placed there. And that's justification by faith. When he takes inventory of your heart and shows you what he has placed there in regeneration, and what do we find? Galatians 5 and 22, and many other places. (laughs) Do we find these things? The fruit of the Spirit. (laughs) But the fruit of the Spirit uh, is this. Does, uh, it doesn't, does, or does it say are these? But the fruit of the Spirit are these. But, you know, that's not good grammar, is it? It come out of the mouth of God by inspiration. Fruit is not uh, plural. Fruit is singular. And for the full in, in comprehension of that fruit, uh, the completeness, the whole of it, it contains nine elements. And these nine elements go to make up this fruit. And this fruit is of the Spirit of God. But the fruit of the Spirit of God uh, are these. Love, joy, I may not can get them. Love, joy, peace, peace, uh, goodness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, temperance. Love is in there. Faith is in there. There's nine of them. <laughs> I might have got three or four or five of them, but there's nine of them. And when God takes them into your heart, he shows what he has placed on the shelf of your heart in the holy place whereby he has sanctified with his holiness and cleansed from your sin. Amen. And the inner man is there fit and prepared for heaven without having need anything else done to it other than regeneration. Not all of the sheep of God are ever justified by faith in the court of their own conscience. That's why we can ask ourselves the question, are you justified by faith in the court of your own conscience? <clears throat> now let us read. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How do you have peace with God? You cannot have peace with God. Appreciate the sermon has been preached on it this afternoon. Unless you've been justified by faith. You may have peace from an eternal, you have peace from an eternal standpoint implanted there, but you don't know what it is <laughs> until God takes inventory of your heart and shows you what he has placed there. Not what you've earned, not what you've merited, not what you've worked for, but freely by his grace, these things accompany the eternal salvation that he's given us. Oh, you talk about a merciful God. Uh, We cannot bring God under obligation to us, can we, Brother Vernon? But God obligates us to his service. And we cannot have peace unless it comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. The justification by faith comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, not around him. There's, for this reason, the only ones that can ever be justified by faith are those under the auspices of the umbrella of Christian religion, not the non-Christian religions. No way in the world they can be justified by faith and satisfied in the court of their own conscience. What does it mean to... uh, to be justified by, for, uh, by faith in the court of your own, own conscience. <clears throat> that means that to yourself, before the court of your own conscience, you become, by reason of fact that God takes inventory of your heart and shows you what He has placed there freely by His grace and given unto you, and given you through the gospel the knowledge of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished on Calvary's cross in bearing your sins in his own body on the tree of the cross and uh, becoming your substitutionary sacrifice. That which we should have bore ourselves, which would have sent us to hell eternally, for the great everlasting eternal love that he had for his people before the world was, he said to his father, in answer, who shall go? Who shall I send? Jesus said, here am I, 
send me. He was sent by his father. He came to do his father's will. John 6, 37, 8, 9, and so forth. <laughs> and he accomplished the will of his father. All things that he did, he pleased his father. He accomplished, well, we had a, an outstanding sermon on this over at Clovis well, Wednesday night. Brother Mike just preached an outstanding sermon on the Trinity of the Godhead and the eternal salvation accomplished for his people through the works of the Trinity, whereby the Trinity uh, is not inconsistent with one another. Oh, that was, I wish that would fit right in here if we had an hour, wouldn't it? He preached up a storm the other night. He was preaching and had to sit down because a storm came up. <laughs> thunder and lightning hailed, and the uh, voice of God through uh, thunder got louder than his voice, so he had to sit down. <laughs> we accused him of preaching fire and hailstone. <laughs> but it says that we have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into grace, uh, whereby we can, uh, uh, by exercising this uh, faith, we can get into grace and therefore become regenerated. No, sir, no, sir. That's not what it says, is it? That's the way a lot of people read it and interpret it and apply it. And they, for that reason, they look, they're forced to look upon their own works. They're holding out faithful in their faith to the end. They realize their, their inconsistencies. They realize their uh, fallibility, fallibility and, and uh, their inconsistencies in their own life. And they become dissatisfied and do not have peace with God and are not satisfied. We that believe that salvation is of the Lord, as our brother just before priest quoted from Jonah, we're satisfied in the court of our own conscience that Jesus did do everything that he came to do. And we're not looking for another. He is my shepherd and I shall not want. I don't want another because I'm satisfied with the work that he done. God has shown me in the court of my own conscience, if not deceived, of uh, that. Jesus paid the price and he paid it all. It was a ransom price that no man could pay. <clears throat> We have access by faith into this grace wherein we already stand. You see, you're already standing in the grace. And we have a continual access into that grace wherein we already stand by the faith that has, uh, whereby we've been justified through our Lord Jesus Christ and whereby he's given us peace. <clears throat> I'm going to have to really cut my illustration short, aren't I? I love to preach on the doctrines of it. But to really convey it, we need to illustrate it. There are three men in the Old Testament that can be abundantly used, in my opinion, <coughs> concerning the manifestation that the evidence that they had been justified by faith in the court of their conscience. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Daniel chapter 3. <clears throat> and we have a lesson here that we'll try hurriedly to go through the lesson hurriedly and as brief as we possibly can. <clears throat> the third chapter of the book of Daniel is speaking of the king Nebuchadnezzar under the Babylonian empire, the captivity, the bondage of, of Babylon. In that era of time, or in Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, verse 1 tells us, made an image of gold. An image of gold. An image of idolatry. An image, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, Nebuchadnezzar could not have been justified by faith in the court of his own conscience. Neither can you. You're not manifesting it, at least, if you set up some image, some idol god in your life. Amen. Whatever that might be. This image that Nebuchadnezzar set up wasn't no small image. How tall was it? Brother Harvey, it was 90 feet tall. 60 cubits. 90 feet tall. It was 9 feet wide. Oh, that was a huge image, was it not? And it was set up uh, in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. <laughs> and Nebuchadnezzar, the king at that time, he sent out to gather together all of the men of, in the seats of high authority, the governors, the rulers, the princes, the captains, the judges, the treasure, treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, 
All these men in seats of high authority. Government law ruling and law making and ruling men. Call them to this place, this province of Babylon, where he had set up this image of gold, and he brought them there for the purpose of dedicating this golden image. So it says that uh, in uh, verse 3, that all that had been bid, it, uh, bid to come to this dedication, they all came. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then an herald cried out aloud, To you it is commanded to all people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of all of these instruments of music, get a point. That's why we don't have instruments of music in our worship service today. <laughs> that they, you would come and assemble yourselves together and you would fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Usually, where instruments of music are found to be present, it ends up worshiping something other than the Lord our God. Instruments of music in the worship service of God, many people will look to the piano or organ player or whatever instrument of music they may have. So, oh, look what they can do. Look what their talent is that has been developed. And God is not even in their thoughts many times. That takes away from the true worship and the service of God and becomes an idol in many people's minds. And it can, it can become a big idol. But nevertheless, I, did, I didn't intend to get into that, but it fit. <laughs> and then the king said, Whosoever falleth not down... Uh, and worship the uh, in the same hour this beast, they shall be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. I want to talk about the furnace just a moment. <laughs> in a moment. And then it says, when they heard uh, that on the sound of these musical instruments, they worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Do you know of any golden images set up by anybody in this world today? Think a little bit. Think about it. <clears throat> yes, sir. How many people in this world have turned from the true and the living God and are, their confidence is in the princes, the rulers, the judges, the counselors, the sheriffs of the wisdom of this old world? Plenty. <clears throat> but nevertheless, wherefore at that time certain Chaldeans came near, and the Chaldeans did not like the Jews. So the Chaldeans accused the Jews. <laughs> and they spake, they went to Nebuchadnezzar, and they said, O king, live forever. That was a, an address, a signification that king, O king, I recognize your authority and your supremacy, and, and, and I... Uh, I give my credence to your power. Our king uh, live forever. Got the king's attention. And he, he said, Oh, thou old king has made a decree. And your decree has been this, that every man that heareth the sound of the musical instruments shall come and fall down and worship this golden image. Uh, we go on down and... Uh, it says, and whosoever falleth not down in worship of uh, this golden image must be cast into the midst of a burning fire furnace. And then these Chaldeans said, O oh, king, there are three Jews here. These are the three men that, that manifested the fact that they were justified by faith in the court of their own, their own conscience. Would you, in their situation, act and react and respond like they did? If so... There is a test. You're justified by faith in the court of your conscience. <laughs> there are certain Jews uh, who, whom thou hast set over the fires of the province of Babylon. Their Babylonian idolatrous names are these. Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego. That wasn't their real names. Their real names are found in uh, Daniel 1 and 6. Uh, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. 
but their Babylonian idolatrous names that was given to them was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I know there's a lot of lessons in this. I don't have time to get into it. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not their gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then these three men were brought before the king, and the king asked them. He addressed them, and he said, Have you not heard the decree of the, of the king? And he reiterated that decree into these three men. <laughs> and then uh, he told them what they would do, what he would do to them if they fell down and not worship. Let, notice verse 15. Now, if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of these musical instruments, I'll not name them all, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. It's well that you do that. We have, uh, we have authorities in the principalities and powers of this world today that says fall down and submit to our decree, and it is well if you adhere thereto and don't give us any rebuttal and backlash. I can get specific, but I'm not. <laughs> but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fire furnace, and who is that God, capital G-O-D, that shall deliver you out of my hands? Nebuchadnezzar certainly wasn't justified by faith in the court of his own conscience. There's no evidence here that he ever even believed in a God at this time of heaven and of earth. <clears throat> now, in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answered the king, and they said, Oh, king, we don't know how, really, how to answer you. We're going to have to meditate and think about this for a while, and we're going to have to dig up all these books and look it up and see how we're supposed to answer you. No, sir. They said, we don't even have to think about it. There's no contention in our minds about this. We have a ready answer. We're not careful to answer thee. Well, we don't have to wait a while. I have an answer right now. Anytime something comes up in this world, in the seats of government or whatever it might be, that is contrary to the Word of God, and they say, bow to the image uh, of this idol and submit yourselves to it and obey it, if we do not respond immediately, it can ensnare us and often does. <laughs> if it be so, they said, God... Uh, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Now they said, if it be so, be so, God is able. Our God is able to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. <clears throat> and he says, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Notice. He said... If you and when you cast us into this burning fire furnace, we don't know whether God will deliver us out of it or not. But we do know this, that God will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. Yes. <laughs> they, they weren't hesitant to say he, but he, and he will deliver us out of thine hand. I want you to know, brethren, regardless of how dark the situations get in this life, don't forget the fact that God is sitting up a throne on His throne today and He's the same sovereign, powerful God that He's ever been. And He has the same power today. He's still seated on His throne and He's a sovereign God. He is and He rules things and He does it the way He wants to. When He wants to. To whom He wants to. How He wants to. And he doesn't ask us anything about it. And God will deliver his children that have been justified by faith in the court of their own conscience, that are satisfied with the work of God and not of their own work in one of three ways. He'll either deliver you in the fire, or he'll deliver you from the fire, or he'll deliver you through the fire. And just rest with that assurance. And regardless of the tribulation or trouble or trial in your life, you'll make it all right because you've been justified by the faith uh, of, uh, in, of God in the court of your own conscience. You're satisfied that God is able to do what he's promised. Amen. Now, <laughs> but if not, be it known, O king, that we will not serve thy God. If God doesn't deliver us out of the burning fiery furnace, be it known that we will not 
serve thy God. That should be our testimony every day of our life. Nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. This made the king mad. He was full of fury. And the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He wasn't the old, the easy-going, soft-talking person that he was. He's mad now. And he spake and commanded that they should be heat the furnace seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Seven times hotter. I've got a point in this. I want you to remember that. <clears throat> And he commanded the most mighty men, the men of war, the men of battle, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's men, that were in his army to bind uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'll use those terms because that's what's used here. And to cast them in the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. They didn't even remove the clothes. Clothes and all were bound. In fact, <clears throat> doing research on this points out the fact that they even took their clothes and rearranged their clothes that they wore to help bind them in their own clothes. Many times, God's children become bound up in their own self-righteousness when we bow to the image of the golden gods that the Nebuchadnezzar of this world sets up. <clears throat> Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of fire through these slew these uh, slew these men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these mighty men that, that cast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in this burning hot, burning fire furnace, uh, seven times more hot than was wont to be made, that fire reached out and consumed the men that cast them in and yet preserved them, the men. Not even the stench of fire smoke was smelled upon their clothes. Fire didn't touch them. They were justified by faith in the court of their own conscience. Regardless of what the tribulation, trial, problem, or insurmountable uh, mountain uh, uh, of opposition that comes in your life, don't take your eye off of the fourth one in the hot burning fire furnace. <laughs> I'm a place here. They fell down. These men, when they were cast in the burning fiery furnace, they fell down. Fell down. I believe that firefighters fire and others are taught that when there is a drastic fire, your safest position is as low as you can get. Humbleness, abasement, is an important attribute in the life of a child of God. <laughs> when he's in the heat of the flames of trials and tribulations in this life. They fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, or astonished. And he rose up in haste, and he spake, and he said unto his counselors, Did not we cast in three uh, men bound into the midst of fire? They answered and said, uh, True, O king. But the king was mis mystified. The kings of this earth will become astonished and mystified when you will not yield to the evil temptations of the tempters, of the snares, of the fowler, of Satan and his devices. In this old life, they'll become mystified and astonished. Who is this, your God? Is he able to deliver you? Let's see. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, not bound now, loose, but still in the fire, but loosed in the fire, Brother Elton, walking now in the fire. We walk by faith, not by sight. The Lord, justifying us by faith in the court of our own conscience, allows and enables us to walk by faith. We're not knowing what tomorrow may bring, but we trust in the Lord that he will open up the way and the uh, necessities for us on the morrow. And they have no hurt, even though they're in the midst of the fire. And the form of the fourth is likened to the Son of God. Wonder who this fourth person is. I've got, I want, I want to end on that. But before I do, I want to come right down to the end of this chapter and uh, or ask you to read it where it teaches 
that because of the faith of these three men in the, uh, having been justified in the court of their own conscience by faith, that became an active faith and a working faith, a moving faith, a working faith. They were showing that faith by their works that others might see that they were justified by faith in the court of their own conscience to the glory and honor of God. <laughs> and uh, this, the action of these three men, small in number compared with all of the men that were there present at that dedication, caused the king's decree to be changed. The faith exercised of God's people in this life, regardless of your tribulation and trouble, if you'll not give in but uh, say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Uh, uh, he is my salvation. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. He's my all and my all. And He will provide. He's able to provide. And He'll provide one of three ways. He'll either deliver me from the fire. While in the fire, He'll give me a deliverance. Or He may leave me in the fire, but He'll be with me throughout the fire times of my life. Whatever, it's God's will. And we should be submissive to whether God sees fit to deliver us out of the fire or to deliver us from the fire or in the fire or through the fire. We should be submissive to God's deliverance, whatever that is. Oh, we could illustrate this so much <clears throat> more. I want to go back to where I want to close. <coughs> They were delivered out of the fire. From the, they were delivered. Being in the fire, they were delivered out of the fire. Okay, they were walking in the midst of the fire, and the fourth one was likened to the Son of God. I wonder who that fourth one was. He said he was likened to the Son of God. Not unto the Son of Man. did not say that. The Lord hadn't been incarnate in his uh, nature at that time. He was likened to the Son of God. <clears throat> Jesus, God was just as able for Jesus to appear in the form of of an individual back there as he was being born of the Virgin Mary, Amen. a little baby. Amen. <clears throat> Wonder what the significance of this all is. Jesus was in the fire. Has Jesus, do you realize and recognize the fact that one time, sometime, Jesus was in the fire for your salvation? Yeah. Yeah. Eternally and timely. His blood, it doesn't just cleanse us for heaven. It continues to cleanse us every day of our life here. <clears throat> In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3, I believe, it says, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And verse 2, it says, For he is like a refiner's fire. What does that mean? <clears throat> It was interesting for me to go back and do a little research <clears throat> on a uh, refiner of silver. And uh, I, I, I learned that silver was prominent back as far as 2500 B.C. And silver has uh, a lot of elements about it that are good for healing and so forth, but it signifies a ransom price, and it signifies a price that only Christ has uh, had to offer a ransom price. The price of silver uh, signifies the purifying of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you that have been purified by his blood. A, a silver refiner would set before an open flame of fire, right up next to the fire, heated to at least 1,761 degrees Fahrenheit. An ore, a nugget of, or of an ore of silver would be placed in the midst of this hot burning fire. <clears throat> As that fire heated to at least 1,761 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, would melt all of the impurities out of that silver, even the oxygen and everything, to where it became pure silver. Small beads of silver would form. It wasn't hot enough. It wasn't in there long enough. Look at the child of God in the afflictions and persecutions and tribulations of your life as the silver that is in the fire. But there is a refiner of that silver 
The Lord Jesus Christ refines the life of his children that have been justified by faith in the court of their own conscience. In the midst of your trials and troubles and tribulation, you are purged. You are refined by the heat of the fiery trials of afflictions in your life. (laughs) Here we have the silver refiner, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, sitting before this fire as it were. Those little beads of silver would get so hot that they would form in multiplicity. And then they'd get hotter. And all of these little beads would amalgamate into one large bead. And that silver refiner would not so much as take his eye off of that uh, silver bead until he could see the mirrored image of his, the reflect, his reflected face in that bead. And at that precise moment, not a moment earlier, nor a moment later, he would reach in and take that silver, purified silver, from the heat of that fire because then it would not crumble. It would not uh, uh, disintegrate. It would not uh, become brittle. And a silversmith could take and mold... Uh, That's silver for various forms and shapes. Brethren, this is a very beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. As he was the fourth one in that burning fiery furnace, he took the heat and the blunt uh, uh, heat of that fire himself and he absorbed it within himself as it were. Also, he lets you go through the fiery furnaces of afflictions in this life so long as it's necessary to wrought a deliverance in your life to accomplish a deliverance in your life when you get to the point to where you say I can't take it anymore I can't go any further I'm about ready to even lay down my own life and take my own life because there's no answer if you can become so despondent and and despair to the point to where you are cast down, the Lord will not uh, uh, let you uh, uh, become cast down to utter despair. Cast down, yes, but destroyed, no. Cast down, but not destroyed. He'll reach in at the precise moment and He'll console and strengthen and edify you and deliver you. He may take you out of that tribulation and trouble and deliver you out of it immediately. Or he may protect you and keep you from ever entering into it. Some of you have troubles and problems that others don't have, and you'll never have them so long as you live. You are delivered from that fire. You that have the problems, insurmountable problems and troubles and tribulations in life, you're in the midst of them. God is able to bring an end to that suffering and deliver you out. Or he may decide that it's better to leave you in there. But he has promised if he does so, he'll be with thee through the fires and through the waters. He'll be with you unto the end. And in the morning of the final resurrection, every one of the children of God, whether they're justified by faith in the court of their own conscience in this life, whether they're justified by their works in this life or not, every one of them because of the refiner of silver, he stood there, on the, uh, hung there on the cross, and he bore our, the fiery indignation of our sins and our corruption and our depravity in his own body on the tree of the cross and in the face uh, of Almighty God. He forever obliterated our sins in his eyes. And God was uh, uh, satisfied. Christ was satisfied. And we should be satisfied while we live in this world. Even if we're not some glorious day, we're going to see him as he is then we'll be satisfied. It it does not yet yet appear what we shall be in John chapter 3, 1 John 3 and 1. For it shall does not appear what we shall be, but we know that when He does appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We're going to see our refiner of silver some glorious day. We're going to see the one someday that has been with us in the midst of the trials and troubles of our life here in this earth. I think you will never look here. I don't just stop. <laughs> We're going to stand and sing some hymn if you're here. 136. 136. Opportunity is yours if you want... Join the church.
do your duty, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow the Lord, you do that, while we stand and sing 136. After we have sung the first verse, we're going to have the cross. Of love and mercy
Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.